Shiva. I'm a, an instructor at CHIP. I'm going to um, talk to you today about um, the most important uh, resources uh, resources for uh, finding and using um, biomedical information, especially information connected with the study of the human genome. Uh, so this is going to be uh, something probably slightly different from what you've heard so far. I'm going to concentrate more on um, actual um, locations and most of them will be websites where you can find information. I'm going to talk about this and how this information is uh, stored and represented, how it's accessible and uh, what it can be used for. Um, the, so you're going to see a long list of references to sites, websites with URLs. Don't worry if you can't remember all of them because of course I'm going to distribute the slides and it will be easier to just look them up. So uh, I'm going to start with something that you've probably heard about many times before. Uh, the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, as you know, uh, almost all our cells contain DNA in their nucleus. DNA is um, a molecule that encodes information, for at least from the uh, purposes of this presentation, this is what we're interested in. And this, inf this information is um, transcribed into RNA molecules that then exit the nucleus under the form of mRNA. mRNA is then translated into proteins, and proteins are uh, ultimately what is responsible for um, essentially all the external uh, manifestations, all the observable properties of um, our, our biology. So I'm talking about things like metabolism in general, physiology, diversity between individuals, uh, disease, drug response. Uh, these are all in some way or another due to uh, the different proteins that act uh, within our cells and outside our cells. So we have names, of course, for uh, the extremes of the spectrum. We call genotype this uh, information is encoded into in the DNA, and on the other hand, we can we call phenotype, whatever is at the other extreme of the spectrum, everything we can observe, can measure from, from the outside. So what I'm uh, going to um, try to show you is that uh, as you move from one end of the spectrum to the other, you're going to encounter very different forms of information, of data, and each one has its own specific um, nature and function and needs to be treated with uh, different tools and needs to be represented in different ways. So, um, and essentially these are the um, questions that I'm going to answer. How is all this information represented? What are the different ways that we can store and, and uh, describe this information? Where does it come from? Where is it stored? How do we find, retrieve, and use it? So, um, We've talked about the two ends of the spectrum. So there are some uh, very uh, deep differences between the kind of information you find uh, when you're talking about the genotype and when you're talking about phenotypes. For example, the genotype is digital because each base pair in our DNA can be exactly represented using one of four symbols, A, T, G, C. Then you can also think about insertions, deletions, and so on. But essentially, uh, using a small number of symbols, you can provide an exact representation of our genome, of all the three billion base pairs that compose our DNA. On the other hand, the phenotype is, uh, say, analog, uh, because most phenotypes are qualitative in nature. They cannot be measured exactly or precisely. They cannot even be defined precisely in most cases. Um, you always have to take into account the effect of environmental factors that, again, are very hard to describe in a quantitative way. Uh, at the root of all this is uh, the, one of the biggest problems in the, in the study of proteins, the fact that the proteins are not uniquely determined by their sequence. Uh, in, for, for DNA, you just look at the sequence and you know essentially all that there is to know about DNA. For proteins, you cannot look at the sequence of a protein and understand just by looking at it what the protein is going to do, not even how it's going to be, um, not even what its three-dimensional structure is going to be. That, that's right, difficult enough. Then understanding what the protein does just by looking at the sequence is still very far from being uh, feasible. 
um, on the other hand, it's interesting to see that our knowledge of uh, these things has progressed in the opposite direction, because obviously it's much easier to observe a phenotype than to observe DNA in our cells. So the first studies of inherited traits date back to Mendel in 1866, and uh, DNA was discovered more or less uh, the same years, but at the time there was no, nobody had any idea there was any connection between these two things, between, the, between DNA and inherited traits. It took uh, over 80 years for this, um, for this concept to be, uh, to, for, for this to be proven. So the, the proof, definite proof that genes are made of DNA um, dates back to 1952. After that, progress was faster because the um, <coughs> elucidation of the structure of DNA and the DNA replication mechanism came one year later. Uh, then the genetic code was deciphered between 1961 and 1966. Something that we now take for granted, like the discovery of introns, uh, only happened in 1977. And finally, uh, the Human Genome Project that uh, was, was uh, officially um, declared a success last year brought us to the point where we now know the exact base pair sequence of uh, our genome. So we now know with a sufficient degree of certainty, and we're going to talk about this more later, we know the exact base pair composition of uh, the human genome and also Man, several other genomes, but of course the human one is the one we're most interested in. Okay, going back again from genotype to phenotype, there's uh, another thing to note. I've just said that we now have the complete sequence for our genome, but of course this is an approximation. It's an abstraction actually, because uh, even if we're all human beings, there are no two human beings that are exactly the same, and this is a consequence of the fact that um, that there are differences between the DNA of two and human beings. These differences are due to uh, polymorphisms, like single nucleotide polymorphisms, so locations which, uh, instead of having the base that everybody else has, you have a different base. Uh, microsatellites, repeats, insertions, deletions, translocations, these are all things that can happen to your DNA sequence and can modify it in ways that, of course, are not uh, uh, enough to turn you into another, to another animal, you're still a human being, but your DNA sequence is slightly different from the sequence that ever, of, of any other human being. Uh, so on the average, there's one of these polymorphisms every 1,000 bases. So if you think we have 3 billion base pairs, it adds up to a very large number of differences. Which means that when you study a human genome, you, I mean, we now have the sequence of the human genome, but then if you go and look at one individual, you're not going to find that his DNA matches exactly the sequence that you find in the, in the human genome databases. You're going to find approximately one difference every thousand bases. And understanding what these differences do and mean and what is their consequence is one of the most interesting problems in um, current bioinformatics and molecular biology, because now we finally have the tools of looking at our genome with this level of detail. We can look at individual base pairs and we can see, well, there should be an A here, and instead we have a C. Does that cause any problem? So again, we're going to go back to this uh, soon. And the same thing happens for phenotypes, although in a slightly different way. So phenotypes are generalizations too, so when we talk about things like species, again, I said, we're all human beings, but we're all different from the genetic point of view. So it means that putting all us together into uh, one big group, in one species is a generalization, of course. And even going down to ethnicity or even a concept like disease, these are all generalizations because these are concepts that, that, concepts that cannot be uh, defined in a precise, formal way. So uh, we will see, and we go as we go forward, that uh, we're going to encounter very different uh, forms of data, and we're going to need different methods to, uh, to manipulate this data according to what the purpose of our work is. So just to make this clear, if we're working at the level of DNA, then the uh, typical um, operations that might be interesting in doing are, for example, sequence matching. So to understand if a certain stretch 
of a sequence uh, matches anything else that uh, you've seen before. So this is useful, for example, when you discover a new gene. You want to know, first of all, if it's really a new gene or if it's already being seen somewhere else. And uh, if it's a new gene, you would like to uh, understand, have an idea of what it does. And if you find a similarity between your new gene and something that's already known, that can give you a lot of information. Uh, we're talking about discovering genes. Finding genes in, in a DNA sequence is not trivial. Uh, there are programs that do this. They just look at the sequence and they find locations in the DNA sequence that might contain genes. And I'm not going to go into details on this, but there are uh, various reasons why this is a pretty complex thing to do from the computational point of view. Um, homology searches. Uh, Again, these are uh, these refer to uh, looking for similarities between DNA between DNA sequences in different organisms. So, if you find, uh, if you discover the function of a certain gene in in the mouse, for example, you want to be would like to know if it does the same thing in humans. So, again, if you find a high degree of similarity between the two genes, uh, you can hypothesize that they are also going to have the same function. Uh, another. We've talked about polymorphism, so another uh, pretty common um, operation that is performed with DNA sequences is SNP detection. So if you sequence the same stretch of DNA from a certain number of different individuals, then you can compare them. And you're going to find that most of the locations are the same for all the individuals, but some of them will be different. And this is, this is how SNPs are discovered, how single nucleotide polymorphisms are discovered. There are locations where uh, different individuals don't have the exact same nucleotide. And um, we'll talk later about why genotyping is important, what kind of information you can get from that, and how this relates to um, to diseases, to basically trying to uh, figure out what is the relationship between the genotype, and in this case, between uh, polymorphisms in your genotype and uh, phenotype-like disease. At the level of RNA, uh, it might be interesting to look at alternative splicing, transcriptional rearrangements. These are all things that happen to the um, to the original DNA sequence when it's transcribed into RNA. It, it is uh, it undergoes a series of transformations that um, that can, of course, uh, affect in a very deep way the, uh, the the final product. And this process, the process of uh, transcribing the uh, DNA sequence into, into RNA, is um, of course, at the basis of expression analysis, and you've heard uh, a lot in the other lectures about microarrays. So, uh, not going to go into too much details on this, but differential analysis, clustering, and so on, these are all the usual uh, things that can be done using microarrays, using gene expression microarrays. If we talk about proteins, uh, if you're studying a protein, the, the interesting things to do with a protein are trying to predict it, its active domains in order to have an idea of what, um, how the protein might behave, what function it might have, how it might interact with other proteins, with, with, with other genes, and so on. Uh, predicting the three-dimensional structure of a protein is uh, another very um, important and very complex task. Studying homology and conservation of proteins across uh, different organisms uh, can give you, an, uh, give you a very good idea of uh, the um, of the importance of some some proteins. So if something has been around for millions of years, as it's going to it probably means that it's involved in a very basic mechanism. While there are some proteins that are it's getting new that they're only specific to human beings, and, and that again can give you some information. And finally, uh, something that is very challenging and uh, it's receiving a lot of attention lately is the automatic construction uh, and analysis of uh, metabolic pathways and regulatory pathways. If you're able to understand how proteins interact with each other and interact with the rest of the, um, of the cell, how they uh, then regulate other genes and in turn other proteins, then you can use this information to try to build in a computational way the kind of uh, pathway maps that biologists have been drawing by hand for uh, decades. And uh, of course, we're still very far away from being able to do this in, in the general case. It, it, um, 
it works in some limited cases, and we're going to see later uh, some examples of um, of these things. But uh, these are all very challenging problems that, of course, are still very much open. And finally, when we get to the phenotype, then uh, we would put a very long list of things here, but we can talk about population genetics, about association studies. Association studies are studies that try to uh, correlate the presence of a certain genotype with an observed phenotype. Like in, in, in the most common case, uh, association studies based on SNPs, they just look at two different alleles of a SNP and they try to uh, figure out if there is statistical correlation between one or two alleles and the disease. And that might mean that the SNP is indeed responsible for the disease in some way. Uh, and clinical trials, of course, to validate all this. Okay, so two more um, slides about philosophy, and then we'll start with the more practical stuff. Uh, I've already mentioned the word gene a lot of times, and I'm going to mention it again uh, very often. So it might be interesting to ask ourselves, what is a gene? And this is something that um, it, it's a question to uh, which the answer is probably obvious, but uh, it turns out that there are actually many possible answers according to the context you're in, according to the uh, different view of, of the world that you are um, that you're using. So, uh, for example, if you ask a classical geneticist what is a gene, you will get the answer that a gene is the smallest unit of inheritance. This is the definition that goes back to, to Mendel, essentially. Uh, if you ask someone who's doing medical research, you will get the answer that the, that the gene is a disease-causing trait. So, we'll hear about uh, the, the thalassemia gene or uh, the gene for cystic fibrosis and so on. So. Uh, in this case, the word gene has a very uh, clear clinical connotation. If you ask a molecular biologist, you'll get the answer that the gene is a recipe, is essentially a program to build one or more proteins. And we can go on, we can ask a biochemist, and you will get the answer that the gene is an element in a, men in a metabolic network. It's, it's an active element in uh, one of those big networks of um, interacting genes that, that regulate each other and that uh, overall realize some metabolic process. If you ask a modern geneticist, you'll get the answer that the gene is a, is a locus on a chromosome, is a certain region of a chromosome that has a functional characterization. It's a locus that was studied and was found, was found to have a uh, specific function in our in our biology. And finally, if you ask a bioinformatician, you will get the answer that a gene is just a stretch of DNA where we know uh, there is a gene because the database tells us that there is a gene there, so we know it has a transcription star site, a coding sequence star site, has exons and introns in certain positions. Okay, so in the following, we're going to see examples of all of these different uh, ways to look at the gene. Okay, and to start, of course, we're going to start from uh, the beginning, so from DNA sequence data. And now we're starting to uh, look at where all these different pieces of information I've told you about can be found and how they're um, stored and represented. So if we're talking about DNA sequence data, the first place to go is, of course, GenBank. GenBank is the largest repository of sequence data. It accepts direct submissions from researchers, so Anybody in the world who sequences a new piece of DNA can send it to GenBank and it's put in the big cauldron. Uh, this is data from one most recent data that, that I could find from one year ago. It contained more than 22 million sequences on 100,000 distinct organisms with a total of almost 30 billion nucleotides. Uh, and uh, this is the URL for GenBank. And GenBank is at the basis of the NCBI cluster. So the National Center for Biotechnology Information is a, is a branch of the NIH that has the uh, task of assembling the largest possible number of databases of biomedical information. They manage GenBank, and um, GenBank, in turn, is at the basis for uh, a lot of other resources that we're going to see now that are all part of this cluster of 
and CBI resources. They're all interconnected, so you can easily jump from one to the other, and uh, that is a very powerful way of exploring this kind of data. So this is a graph that shows you the growth of GenBank in recent years. You can see the very steep growth of the number of base pairs and the almost uh, equally steep rate growth of the number of sequences. And uh, you can probably tell that the number there were sequences longer were sequencing longer and longer sequences because the blue graph grows more rapidly than, than the red one. But anyway, um, what do you do when you have all these accumulated sequences? So in GenBank, you just have sequences by themselves that can be very short, very long, but they're just independent sequences that were put there by investigators. So the thing you can do if you have enough sequences from the same organism, you can try assembling them, putting them together, and trying to reconstruct the entire genome. And this is... Um, what was done to uh, assemble the human genome, for example, and all the other genomes that are being sequenced, uh, you start with, um, you, you look at the class, you look at the sequences you have, and if you can find overlaps, then you know that these two sequences are related in some way, and you proceed from there. So let's say you've sequenced this sequence, then another one, they're, they're this thing, they have an overlap, so you don't know where they are on the genome. But then if you sequence a third one that overlaps the first one and includes the second one, then you know that you can basically arrange them in this, in this way. And uh, then let's say you sequence another one, and again you find an overlap with one that you already have. So you go on like this, and in the end you're going to build uh, a map that tells you where all these fragments should be positioned on the chromosome. And you have different levels of coverage, so you have regions that you've seen only once, regions you've seen twice, regions you've seen, seen three times. If you have a sufficient degree of coverage, then you can say, well, okay, I, I believe it's going, this, this is the right sequence. And, uh, and you proceed from there. You take that for, uh, for granted. You proceed from there by connecting more and more overlapping pieces. And again, this is how the human genome was sequenced, essentially. Uh, up to a level of coverage, uh, I think it's five or six times coverage. So each stretch of DNA in the human genome has been sequenced at least five or six times for uh, validation. So, and the details of uh, how this process has been implemented in CBI are here. Uh, and in addition to the human genome, of course, we have a lot of other genomes that are completed or near completion. Uh, these numbers are probably higher by now. Uh, we have over a thousand viruses and then many other uh, organisms from uh, different domains of life. Of course, eukaryotes are the hardest organisms to, uh, to sequence, but uh, the human genome is considered finished by now. It's, uh, it, it's harder, it's harder to, to go above this level of accuracy. It's even, I mean, it's probably not it's even not necessary because the differences between two human beings are, are probably the same order of magnitude. So, um, uh, but now we have uh, several other organisms, including a chimp that was recently released, and uh, it's going to be very interesting because it's essentially identical to the human genome. So there is uh, one percent. The differences are about one percent between the genomes of the human and the chimp, and it will be very interesting to see exactly where these differences are and 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 why these differences are responsible for the fact that we are humans and they are uh, monkeys. Again, this is a link that, uh, to um, the entry point for the description of all the genomes that are stored at NCBI. And, and new genomes, the, the small ones, the viruses and bacteria, there are new genomes essentially every week. So it's, uh, these numbers constantly change. Now, uh, we, we now have the complete sequence of the human genome. Where do you find it? So the best resource, in my opinion, for uh, um, looking at the human genome, in, in literally, is Golden Path. Uh, Golden Path is uh, a genome browser for several different organisms. Initially, it was only for human. Now it has mouse, rat, chimp, drosophila, yeast, and a few others. 
the, the nice things about Golden Path is that it has uh, it gives a graphical view. So uh, you're going to see it in the next slide. It's very uh, it's very clear. It's very easy to find uh, all the information you need about a certain region of a chromosome. Uh, on the other hand, uh, all the information it provides is available in uh, in easy to download and to parse formats. So if you want to build your own database that contains the same information, that's something that is uh, pretty easy. It provides arbitrary DNA sequences. So you can ask for any region of any human chromosome, you'll get back the exact DNA sequence for that region, which is something that you might think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easy by now, but two or three years ago, it was still something that was almost uh, impossible to, to obtain, and Golden Path was the first site to provide something like this. It gives you the absolute position of uh, all the known elements of our genome, so genes, markers, mutations, other features. They tell you exactly they are at this location in terms of the absolute uh, base pair. This is the URL for Golden Path, and this is how it looks like. This is an example. We're looking at the region that contains uh, the TLR1 gene, and you can see all these different tracks that provide different um, information on different objects. So, for example, up here we have the genes. We have different sets of known genes. We have predicted genes according to different prediction algorithms. Uh, we have the mRNAs that were uh, aligned to this gene. We have um, we have a track like this one that shows you the conservation between human and mouse in this region. So you can see, it's very interesting to see that obviously the uh, coding part of the gene is the one that is most highly conserved between human and mouse because it's the functional part, so it undergoes uh, selective pressure. There are tracks that tell you the location of SNPs and so on. There are many others that, of course, don't fit in here, but you can customize the display. You can select the tracks you want to see and you get your own view of uh, of a certain genetic region. You have the coordinates up here, chromosome 4, the band, and so on. And this is just to show that you can query it for any, this is the same um, DNA region we were looking at before, but in this case we asked for the DNA sequence and we get it. There's another uh, way of looking at the genome using the NCBI map viewer. Uh, it's essentially the same thing. It's a graphical browser to look at, at genomes and annotations of genomes. Uh, it, it's organized around several maps. They have sequence maps, cytogenetic maps, uh, linkage maps, vision hybrid, human mouse homology maps. So each one of these is a view that gives you a different set of um, different set of objects in the view. So in the sequence map, you find information about the genes, uh, transcripts, unigene clusters, and so on. In the cytogenetic map, for example, you find uh, information about disease genes, about bands, breakpoints. Uh, it's, it's extremely detailed because, of course, it can rely on the whole set of uh, NCBI databases, so basically everything that could possibly um, want to know uh, is in there. Uh, I personally find it a bit uh, complex to use, a bit harder to use than, than Golden Path, but it's a matter of taste. It's organized in a different way. Uh, shows you much more detailed information here in these graphical bars on, on the features of the, uh, of the genetic region, but then the coding this information is a bit harder. They use all these abbreviations here, so it's a matter of taste. Uh, they essentially serve the same purpose with different levels of um, detail in different areas. Now, we've talked about SNPs. It's the only form of mutation we're going to talk about, but it's also the most important one because, first of all, SNPs are the most common form of variation in our genome. Uh, they're much more frequent than microsatellites or uh, insertions, deletions, and other things. And they're important because, for example, they can be used as genomic markers. So SNPs are at a fixed location in the genome. And if you know where the SNP is, you can find it. You can find the same location in uh, different individuals. So you can use them as markers. You can use them as causal candidates for diseases because uh, a certain percentage of the SNPs introduce changes that then have some consequence on the um, on on basically the um, 
the genotype and, and the phenotype. What, what I mean is that, for example, if you have a SNP in the coding sequence of a protein, you're going to get a protein that has a uh, abnormal sequence, and that can be a change that doesn't cause any any consequence, or it might be a very uh, dramatic change. For example, the, the the most extreme example is there are some SNPs that introduce a stop in the protein sequence. So the protein sequence is truncated. Instead of just being modified, it's truncated. It's shorter than it should be. And there are, uh, uh, you can imagine this is a change that, that can be very um, dangerous. There are many diseases that are due to the fact that uh, you have SNPs that truncate proteins. They can be used as evolutionary markers between, because SNPs arise randomly during in a replication, and then they are transmitted from one generation to the next. Uh, and there are, uh, it's very interesting to study uh, how SNPs, um, how SNPs get, uh, how the frequency of a SNP changes in the population. So if you have a SNP that provides an advantage to you, because I mean most of SNPs are deleterious, but in some cases a SNP can also provide an advantage if it generates something that was uh, not present before and that works better than the original. So if you have a SNP that introduces a, a change that is beneficial, then you will, given, given enough time, you will see that the frequency of the SNPs increases in the population. More and more individuals are going to have the variant form, the SNP. Uh, on the other hand, if a SNP is neutral, then there is no selective pressure, and it will either go away by chance or will stay at a certain uh, basic level of frequency. So you can study the frequency of a SNP to understand if it's if it's undergoing selective pressure, so to know if it's deleterious or not. Uh, or you can um, or you can use it to reconstruct the uh, basically the history of our genome. You can use uh, there are ways of calculating the age of a SNP so you know when that mutation arose in the um, in the history of our genome. Now the largest uh, database of SNPs that we have, again, is at NCBI. It's called DBSNP. Currently contains over 4 million human SNPs. Actually, I think that by now this number is closer to 5 million SNPs. And almost 50% of these SNPs are validated, which is uh, something very important. It means that, that the SNP has been observed independently multiple times. So, uh, so you know it's a true SNP. It's not, it could be um, many, many times uh, since sequencing is not an exact process. If you just look at a set of sequencing traces, you could think that there is a SNP when it's actually just a uh, sequencing error. Now, if the SNP was validated, it means it was observed several times by independent investigators, and that gives you the almost uh, total certainty that it's a true SNP. Uh, there are other databases of SNPs. Uh, another very important one is the SNP Consortium database at Cold Spring Harbor. That offers uh, the important thing about TSC is that they, uh, first of all, all the TSC SNPs are validated. So they basically take SNPs from DB SNP and they check them again to make sure that they're really SNPs. And while doing that, they also look at the frequency of these SNPs. So what do I mean? You know, a, a SNP is a is a, um, is a polymorphism that substitutes the nucleotide you should have in one location with a different one. Okay. So if you look at uh, a population of individuals, uh, you're going to see that the major allele of the SNP, the one, the common one, has a certain frequency. So it appears, for example, in 80% of the individuals, and the alternative allele appears in 20% of the population. Now, knowing this frequency is very important because uh, it allows you then to uh, do association studies. For, for example, to look for a correlation between a disease and this polymorphism, because if then you observe a second population <laughs> that is affected by a disease, and you find that, that in that second population, the alternative allele occurs with a frequency of 40% instead of 20, then there might be an indication that the SNP has something to do with the disease. But in order to be able to do this, you have to know what is the baseline frequency, what is the original frequency in uh, normal, so to speak, human beings. Yes? Um, I guess that's what I was going to say next. Of course, the biggest problem here is that uh, different populations may have different frequencies of SNPs. And uh, this is one of the reasons why SNPs are uh, used for population genetics, because especially in the past, when populations were much more close than they are now, if a SNP 
arises in a population, then it tends to uh, be limited to that population. You're not going to find it in 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 a, in a different population unless there is some genetic interchange between the two. So when you look at the frequency of a SNP, it's very important to specify what population you're looking at because we're going to have an example in, in two slides. So let's just get back to this in a second because I wanted to tell you about other SNP resources quickly. Um, the haplotype map project. This is kind of a new project that is uh, is aimed at developing a haplotype map of the human genome. I don't know if you had a lecture about haplotypes, about selecting you're going to, okay, uh, so you're going to have it later than this one, but when you hear about uh, about haplotypes, just remember that HapMap is a project that is aiming at uh, building a complete haplotype map of the human genome. And don't have time to go into that now, but it, it's a very important resource that is it's really the next step after uh, what TSC is doing, after uh, determining the frequency of SNPs in different populations that uh, the HapMap project allows you to understand uh, basically what this can tell you about the uh, evolution of our genome. But this will become clear when in, in the lecture about haplotypes. Uh, HGBase, another database of SNPs, uh, it's, a, it's manually curated, so you find inf it's, it's very limited, but you find information that has very high quality. It's all manually verified, and it's a, focuses on, on the potential uh, consequences of SNPs. So you're going to find a lot of information about known associations between SNPs and diseases. Alfred uh, at Yale is another very small database, but it has a very high uh, quality, and it focuses on frequency data. And what they do is very, very interesting. They go look at many, many different populations. And especially a population, a small isolated populations from where we are places like, like small islands in, in uh, Pacific or uh, remote villages in Siberia and so on. So they actually try to look for isolated populations to um, maximize the differences in SNP frequency that they are going to find in order to have a uh, picture of, the, of human diversity that is as complete as possible. Uh, and finally, we have Snipper that I'm citing because we developed it, a chip. Uh, this is an, it's a resource that tries to integrate information from all the places that are cited so far. So it takes information mainly from the SNP, from Golden Path, from, um, from TSC, from Alfred, from HGBase, and it tries to put everything together in a, in a unified view that allows you to look at the gene find all the SNPs that are on that gene, see all the features of the SNPs, whether they are uh, the affected coding sequence or the promoter sequence or whatever, and then look at the everything that, look at everything that is known about about individual SNPs and it has um, provides a way of exporting this data in different formats to make it easier to process later. And uh, I'm just gonna show you one slide from Snipper, but uh, this is a this, is a window that describes, that tells you information about the particular SNP. This is a DBSNP identifier. And so you can see there is a top part where you have general information where the SNP is. This is the position on chromosome 6, what the alleles are, um, the gene it belongs to, notch 4. And here it tells you that this gene is uh, in the coding sequence of the gene, and it actually causes an amino acid change at, at position 319. Uh, it affects protein domains. This is the list of protein domains that are affected by the SNP. Uh, this is the list of submitters. Uh, all the investigators who have observed the SNP, and it's it's a long list, so it means that this is definitely a true SNP. And finally, under here, I wanted to show you uh, this data comes from TSC, and it's the frequency information data. So. Um, they sampled 41 individuals from a population of African Americans, and they found that these are the frequencies for the two alleles, 72% A, 28% G. And then they looked at a different population. These are Caucasians, I think. And they found very different allele frequencies, so different that what was the minor allele in the first case is now the major allele. So uh, this is a very clear demonstration of why it's important to know what population we're talking about when we um, study the frequency of a SNP because if you started, if you take 
if you believe these numbers and then you uh, try to run an association study using the SNP on a population on a different population you're going to find totally different numbers that and, and this doesn't have anything to do with disease you're going to just get uh, results that are misleading because you are not looking at the same population and the baseline frequency of the SNP in the two populations is very different. So this is um, uh, just to show that um, the, the advantages of having an integrated view that brings together information from different sources and allows you to get a clear picture of what the SNP does and, and everything that is known about it. Excuse me? This one? Uh, well, um, it's just telling you that uh, proteins have uh, the sequence of a protein is um, what well, contains portions that are active domains. They are the portions of the protein that then physically uh, do something. They, for example, uh, this domain here is the extra, extra, uh, extracellular domain. It's the domain that goes outside uh, the cell. This is a calcium binding domain. So these are uh, stretches of the protein sequence that are known to have some functional, um, some functional. They're important because they, they do something. And if you have a SNP that affects one of them, that SNP in turn might uh, cause the protein to work. Um, to to um, I mean, it can change the function of a SNP so of a protein. Uh, well, this is, this is not meant to be an accurate prediction of what the SNP does. Uh, and we get so many because all these domains are overlapping. Um, and this, is, this information comes from Swiss Profit Database of Protein Information. And uh, so you see, for example, this uh, first domain covers almost all of the protein. So you get more than six, right? So two different Excuse me? So six would be the maximum number? No, no, no. It's just that, they, that these domains can be overlapping. It's just because the, the, the Swiss pro people, they annotate the protein sequence saying, OK, from here to here, we know that this happens. But um, well, sometimes they, they, well, there are some domains that, that cover the entire protein or half of the protein just because, for example, in this case, the extracellular domain, it means that this portion of the protein is, is extracellular. Uh, and then inside that domain, you can have other subdomains like all these that have other, other characteristics. So I'm just reporting here a list of all the domains that, that contain that location, but they can be overlapping. OK, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the SNP affects all of them in some meaningful way. Uh, this one is probably the only one that could be um, affected by the presence of a SNP because it's, it's a binding domain, so it might be that it doesn't work anymore as a binding domain. So don't get confused by this display. It's just a list of, of Swiss Pro domains that, are, that include that location. OK. Now the next step, I'm going to talk about genes again. Uh, and the starting point uh, when we talk about genes is locus link. Locus link um, is a curated directory of genes from 13 organisms. Uh, the word curated here is very important. So genes are discovered either experimentally or uh, by um, programs like GenScan that look at the DNA sequence and, and um, tell you where a gene might be. Then the gene has to be studied in order to know what it does, uh, what all its relationship to other genes and to biological processes are. So um, Locus Link is basically a repository of information about genes, and it collects everything that is known about genes. So uh, they, they say their central function is to establish an accurate connection between the defining sequence for Locus and other descriptors. It basically means you have a stretch of DNA, you know that there's a gene. Let's collect everything that is known about, about that gene. Uh, so it gives you information about the sequence itself, about the functions of the gene, uh, links to other databases about the gene, different names for the gene, phenotypes that are known to be associated with that gene, homologies to other genes in the same organism or in different organisms, 
the location of this gene in, in several different maps. This is all information that you can find in Locus Link. And the most important thing, uh, at least from uh, our point of view, is that Locus Link provides a nomenclature of genes. No, Locus Link assigns a name to each gene, and uh, if you stick to that name, then you're sure you, that everybody knows what you're talking about. Uh, because this, again, it might seem a trivial problem, but um, for historical reasons, in many, many cases, genes have lots of different names. Even if, the, if it's the same gene, uh, people have been calling them with different names, and it's a mess when you try to, to sort out which gene is which. If you stick to the locus link nomenclature, then you, at least you know you have one way of naming genes, and that's it. Uh, so it gives a name, it gives a number, and you can use these as identifiers to look up your gene in other databases if they use the same nomenclature. And of course, uh, again, it's part of the NCBI cluster, and all NCBI resources use this way of naming genes. Then unfortunately, there are other resources that we'll going to mention later that use a different way of naming genes. And uh, this uh, makes things very difficult when you're trying to build uh, programs that integrate information from different places, because uh, it's very, very hard to know exactly how to reconcile different ways of, of naming genes. Again, it might seem a trivial problem, but uh, but it's not. And it's also complicated by the fact that, uh, as we were saying before, uh, <coughs> genes may appear in several different forms. Uh, there are variants of the same gene. There are um, similar. There are genes that are very similar to each other. So sometimes they are considered to be the same gene. Sometimes they are not. And and all these are things that make the uh, Make naming genes uh, kind of a complex and uh, um, not um, deterministic task. So Unigene is another resource at NCBI that takes a slightly different approach. Uh, it it's an attempt of uh, at collecting all the gen bank sequences that refer to uh, a region of the genome where a gene is known to be. So essentially. Uh, if we know that a certain region of, our, of a chromosome contains a gene, then we can go into GenBank and look at all the sequences that fall into that region. So all the sequences um, come automatically come from, from that gene, are part of that gene. Uh, and Unigene puts them all together in one cluster and then, um, and then tries to provide an, a description of all why all these sequences of a description of uh, the features of all these sequences. So they're all similar. They all come from the same location, from the same uh, region of the genome. But uh, they might represent multiple forms of the same gene. So they're probably not identical to each other. They might come from different tissues. So they might have uh, different properties and, and so on. Uh, and again, this is the URL for Unigene. It uh, includes information for 38 organism. And I think that one year ago, this number was something like 14. So it's growing very fast. And um, the, the interesting thing is this, this is an automated process. So Locus Link is a curated directory. It means that there are there's people who spend their uh, days going through gene records and, and adding information, checking it, correcting it. Unigene is an, automat is an automated system. So uh, it's actually a automatic procedure that, that looks into uh, all looks at all the gen bank sequences and tries to build these clusters based on um, on the uh, on the location of these sequences. I've mentioned the fact that it's interesting to study homologies between um, genes in different organisms. So homology is a database of orthologs. So uh, what it does, it is uh, they take all the sequences in GenBank, they compare each sequence with all the other sequences in GenBank, at least in a, um, in, a, in a set of organisms. And, um, and if they find a good match between the two sequences, then this, this pair is added to the homology database. So right now, it's, um, it encompasses 25 organisms. and in these 25 organisms, they have 470,000 
ocelot pairs. So pairs of genes from different organisms that are highly similar to each other. The, all these are put into a um, into the database, and then if you find that there are three organisms that share uh, a similarity relationship, then this in turn is is marked because it means that um, that you're finding a, a match that has an even higher quality. So if you find that organism A shares a gene with organism B and B shares it with C, if then you find that C shares it with A, then you've built what they call a triplet, and um, that's a confirmation that actually this gene might be really the same gene that is conserved across all these organisms. Um, and this one is partly curated, partly calculated, so uh, they have an automated procedure that uh, looks at sequence similarity using one of the many algorithms to do that, and they give you the similarity score, and then they have a subset, uh, yeah, this is not mentioned here, but, but then most of these uh, entries in the database are also manually curated to make sure that they're um, really that they're really similar genes. Uh, I think it's a swift mo swift. Uh, no, it's part of the blast score. Okay. Yeah. They have a threshold of something I don't remember, but they give you the score in the in addition to all the other information. So. Okay, um, ensemble. This is not part of NCBI. This is something that comes from Europe, from the EMBL, European Bioinformatics Institute, the Sanger Institute. Uh, it's something that is pretty similar to Locus Link in, in scope. It's, uh, again, it's a, it's a software system for the automated annotation of genomes. It basically means it's a system that discovers genes and tries to find as much information as possible about these this genes. And, uh, and then all the information is available through a search interface. It's limited to 10 organisms, uh, but it provides a lot of information about, uh, about the genes in this, uh, about these organisms. So it provides information about genes, about proteins, diseases, SNPs, cross-species analysis, microarray data. So it's essentially a combination of locus link, DBSNP, um, homology and a few other things. It has a very powerful uh, data access interface, which is actually very nice, very easy to use. Uh, so you can do queries on this huge database um, in a relatively simple way. Uh, one of the biggest problems with this system, uh, at least from our point of view, is that uh, it uses its own way of naming genes. This is essentially what I was referring to before when I was saying that not everybody uses the locus link way of naming genes. They have an, uh, their own alternative uh, scheme for naming genes, and going from one to the other is, is sometimes tricky. There are links between the two databases, but of course it's not. Uh, they don't necessarily match very well. What else? Okay, and finally a few words about gene regulation. So gene regulation, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's almost uh, needless to say, it's an extremely complex mechanism. Our understanding of how gene regulation works is still very limited. Uh, when you hear uh, about microarrays, about gene, the, the concept of gene expression that is measured by microarrays, this is a uh, gene expression is the most, um, let's say, uh, visible consequence of everything that is uh, in, in this complex mechanism. So there, there is a, um, what, what you see is that under certain conditions, a certain set of genes is, is highly regular, is, is highly expressed or, or um, underexpressed and so on. But this is a consequence of the fact that there is a very complex machinery behind it that, uh, that determines which genes are active or not and how much in different conditions. So. And, and this is actually a system that integrates uh, a lot of different factors that might include the following for, um, in no particular order, the tissue. We know very well that uh, the set of genes that are expressed in one tissue is very different from the set of genes that are expressed in another tissue. Uh, the mental stage, genes that are expressed during uh, 
the development of the embryo, for example, are not the same. They're expressed in an adult uh, organism. The time, the time can mean either the time of day. You, for uh, in cases like the circadian rhythm, there are genes that are expressed in the morning and not in the not in the evening. Uh, or time at a larger scale, there are uh, I mean it, there are processes that take years to complete, like um, uh, puberty, for example. These are so there is a this this uh, regulation mechanism is able to work at at very different. Uh, temporal resolutions. Uh, external signals, of course, are all uh, response to external stimuli. Uh, and it also depends on the expression state of any number of other genes, because genes uh, regulate each other uh, through feedback loops and so on. So again, it's a very complex system. We're slowly working to try to understand how it works. Uh, so what we have for now is um, some understanding of what transcription factors do. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to the upstream regions of the genes and are able to control their expression and their activity. We call transcription factor because usually, uh, in the most common case, these bind to the uh, promoter region of a gene. They combine with each other, forming complexes. And these complexes then uh, activate the transcription machinery that then gives rise to the um, what well, starts everything else, and in the end, you get that the gene is expressed because it's translated and the protein is produced. But, um, <clears throat> and uh, transcription factors, as I was saying, don't act alone. They, they have to interact with the target gene, but they also interact with each other uh, in a combinatorial fashion. What this means is that um, looking at the individual transcription factor is usually not sufficient to understand what it's going to do, because the same transcription factor in different combinations with other transcription factors might have different uh, different roles. So what we need to look at is, is the pattern of transcription factors that binds to a certain gene. And that, in turn, will determine the um, spatial, temporal, tissue-dependent expression of the target gene. Okay. Uh, and again, we are still doing the very early steps uh, in the process of trying to understand how uh, these patterns are actually structured, how they work. So what do we, ah, OK, sorry. So the first step, again, we're moving the first steps. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to be able to reliably identify which, trans of, which transcription factors bind to uh, a given gene and where exactly in the promoter region of the gene they bind. Uh, and Transition factors bind to locations that are called transition factor binding sites. Uh, there are small stretches of DNA that are recognized by the factor. And um, so if you know where the binding sites are, you have a first idea of um, what factors bind to this, to this gene uh, and how they may be arranged spatially. So if you know that two factors have to interact with each other, uh, probably their binding sites will have to be close to each other. Or at least, let's say, if, the, if you find two binding sites that are close to each other, there is a very high chance that the two factors will interact. And uh, it might be that they, when they interact, they act in a certain way. Where they don't interact because they're far apart, then they act in a different way. And so knowing the map of binding sites in the promoter of a gene is something that can uh, give you uh, some initial information that you can build on. Uh, it's Still, something is very hard to do computationally. Uh, the, the ways that um, tools that people have been using to do this uh, are usually based on pattern matching. So the binding site, as I said, is a small stretch of DNA. Usually it goes from 5 to about 20 or 25 base pairs. So they're really short. And they're characterized by uh, consensus sequences. They are not very, in general, they are not very um, Concerned, not very precise. So it, it, it's uh, essentially impossible to look at a piece of DNA and say, well, OK, I'm sure that this location here is a binding site. <coughs> so you can try using uh, deterministic methods, like, like just looking for um, instances of, of the motifs. Uh, sorry. I thought I had something on this. but. Um, you can look for instances of the motifs 
uh, using either deterministic methods or probabilistic methods, pattern matching, there's a lot of things that you can try. Uh, and in uh, almost all cases, uh, people rely on Transfec. Transfec is a largest, the largest available database uh, about transcription factors. It's a database that provides information on the factors themselves. It provides examples of their binding sites. Uh, and it provides uh, descriptions of their interactions with genes. And the important thing is that most of the information is in Transpec is experimentally validated. So for example, the binding sites, these are binding sites that have been observed experimentally. So uh, you, you, actually, you can actually trust the fact that that particular piece of sequence they give you is a binding site for the transcription factor in question. And uh, okay, so in the end, uh, without going into too much detail, what you can do is you can take these binding sites, you can use them to train your favorite pattern matching method, uh, and then you can try scanning new sequences looking for binding sites. And there are, uh, this is one of the things that we're currently working on at CHIP. There are various ways of doing this, and it, again, it's a rather uh, difficult problem from a computational point of view because these patterns that you have to look for are not very um, specific. They're not th very um, clear. Uh, on the other hand, uh, doing it computationally, uh, sorry, doing, doing it experimentally is very slow, very expensive. So you can only do that for a small number of genes and a small number of factors. If you have a method like this, uh, if you have a computational method to detect binding sites that works well, then you can think about doing this on a large scale, looking for, for example, all the binding sites for a certain factor in all the human genes. And that will give you uh, a very interesting picture of everything that might be regulated by that factor. So we're not there yet. This is one of the things we're working on in our lab. And, uh, and it's going to take a lot of work, but it, the, the rewards are potentially very interesting because this is something that will then allow you, if it works, to um, to build to automatically build the networks that describe how genes regulate each other, and that is something that, uh, of course, has a lot of potential interest. Uh, okay, we talked about gene expression. We talked about microarrays. Uh, you might have already uh, heard about these things, but uh, I was just going to list the uh, main sources of available microarray data, public microarray data. So for example, again at NCBI, um, GEO is a database, Gene Expression Omnibus, is a database of gene expression and hybridization array data. It uh, offers 12,000 experiments, essentially 12,000 hybridization experiments on over 500 different platforms. Uh, so if you're interested in doing some form of data analysis on microarray data and you don't have the time or the money to uh, sorry, to do your own microarrays, you can go to GEO and you have 12,000 of them to, to choose from. Uh, and they also offer a very powerful interface to search since microarray data sets are very large, they, they include thousands of measurements, uh, you need, um, they, they provide a very um, useful search interface that allows you to select the data sets you're interested in and to extract data from these data sets and look at, for example, the behavior of the same gene in different experiments or uh, different genes in the same experiment. And, and there are lots of different queries that are common when you work with microarray data. Uh, the Stanford Microarray Database, again, is a repository of all the micro, of large number of uh, microarray experiments performed at Stanford, and a portion of these are public. NCI60, again, from Stanford, is a famous data set that includes gene expression profiles for 60 human cancer cell lines. And the um, information on drug activity correlated with gene expression patterns. So they uh, measure how the gene expression uh, patterns change when these cell lines are subject to different, uh, to different drugs. 
other resources for uh, gene expression are found uh, in different PGA projects. PGA are programs for genomic applications. They are large projects managed by the NIH. So the TREX PGA, for example, offers 565 microarrays from mouse and rat models of sleep, infection, hypertension, pulmonary disease. The Hop Genes PGA, uh, again, more than 500 microarrays from, from several human diseases. Cardiogenomics uh, provide microarray data on mouse models of uh, cardiac development and signal transduction. And finally, the Human Gene Expression Index. These are just some of the most important, the most uh, useful public resources for microarray data. <coughs> Okay, um, I'm going to go through this uh, final part very quickly um, because I'm almost out of time. And uh, if you'd rather stop me with questions or if there's anything you would like to discuss about what I said so far, we could stop here or I could just run through this last um, portion quickly. So. This last part was about uh, the last step in the process from proteins to phenotypes. Uh, I was going to talk about protein databases. Uh, the situation in protein databases is a bit different from what we've seen so far. Protein database, the, the protein world is, is much more complex than the DNA and RNA world for the reasons that I've explained in the beginning. Uh, some of the reasons are that proteins interact with each other in very complex ways, they combine in three dimensions, they catalyze chemical reactions. They um, generally have a behavior that is much harder to describe in, in um, quantitative terms than um, than everything else we've seen so far. Uh, so what protein, protein databases give you is usually information about the, the sequence of a protein, and that, that's the easy part. <coughs> the known or computed three-dimensional structure, the known or inferred functional domains, and ideally also the uh, function of the protein, what the protein does in different conditions. But again, this is we're getting to the um, area where things start becoming hard to uh, formalize and to represent in, in a computational system. So as a consequence, uh, protein databases, first of all, tend to be older because they were uh, started earlier than genomic databases. They're less integrated. They're less complete. Nomenclature is, is a mess. It's much less standardized. So it's it, it, it's harder to work on protein databases than uh, with all the other resources we've seen so far. The biggest database is SwissProt, uh, 120,000 sequence entries, 9,000 human proteins in SwissProt, which uh, is a pretty small number if you think that we already have complete information in Golden Path about 20,000 genes, and each gene is known to, on the average, code for probably two or more proteins. So. Uh, these are the proteins for which we know something, and they're very, very, very small number compared to the total number of proteins that are thought to be in our cells. It's composed of a core um, set of data elements, the sequence, the references, taxonomic data for this protein, and then annotations about the functions of this protein, domains and sites, the structure, similarities, association with diseases, variant forms of the protein. Uh, and again, this it's hard to link this database with locus link or unigene, but uh, it, it's uh, its own identifiers for proteins. But don't need to go into these problems now. This is a graph that shows you the growth of Swiss prot in recent years, and as you can see, it's growing, but at a much smaller rate than GenBank or other resources like that. Um, we have databases about the three-dimensional structure of proteins, like PDB different visualization options. Uh, MMDB is essentially the same thing, but uh, implemented in CBI. PFAM at the Sanger Institute is a database of uh, protein domains and protein families. They uh, look for domains in the proteins, and then they look for similarities between proteins on the basis of the domains that were identified. Uh, they use similarity measures. They use hidden Markov models. Uh, again, they have a curated portion with a small number of protein families uh, with 
but the annotation there is a high quality. And then uh, there is a second portion of PFAM that has smaller families of lower quality. This is an example of a display, a, a PFAM display of a protein with all the different domains that were found in the protein with the chaos here. So give it this nice graphical display. Uh, I'm going to skip protein interaction databases and I um, want to get, okay, to the end, uh, we're getting to the phenotype end of the spectrum finally. And there's just a couple of resources that have to be cited because they're extremely important. One of them is OMIM. OMIM is a catalog of human genes and genetic disorders, uh, again, hosted by the NCBI. It's, um, it's, it's basically a collection of, of uh, text articles that talk either uh, about a gene or about a disorder, and they're linked with each other. So uh, if you're looking at the entry for a gene, you can find um, a description, by chemical feature, the function mapping, and then you can find cor all known correlations between that gene and diseases. Uh, allelic variants, so all known polymorphisms of that gene with the corresponding uh, clinical outcome if there is any. And then you can also go the other way around. Um, it has uh, 14,000 entries. Again, these numbers are probably um, larger by now because, again, this is a graph that shows you how it, it's not very up to date, but you can imagine that it's been growing at least at this speed or faster since 98. And finally, PubMed. Uh, you probably all know what PubMed is. It's a database of citations from the biomedical literature. It contains 12 million entries starting from the mid-60s, and um, it provides references, abstracts, links to online uh, resources full text articles, in some cases, supplementary materials. Uh, and it's one of the most used resources in this field. There are, they claim they receive 30 million searches per month. OK. Uh, one last thing, geontology. Uh, geontology is something that stays at a slightly higher level above everything that we've seen so far. Uh, the the idea of genontology is to build a dynamic control vocabulary that can be used to describe biological concepts. Uh, if you look at something like, like OMIM or PubMed, you're going to find a textual description, for example, of a disease that references concepts that, uh, that need, to have, need to be precisely defined so that we all know we're talking about the same thing when you use the same word. And the purpose of genontology is to try to do this in uh, uh, at least three domains, uh, molecular function, biological process, cellular component. So uh, it's organized on three taxonomies, and each taxonomy contains concepts and subconcepts and so on that um, try to describe everything that is known about molecular functions, biological, biological process, and cellular component using a standardized nomenclature. So that when you want to refer, for example, for to a certain component of a cell, instead of just saying its name, uh, you can cite the genontology term that describes that component, and everybody else will be able to go to genontology and see what's the exact definition of the word you're using. Uh, it's a work in progress, uh, still very far from being complete. It has all the usual problems that occur when you're trying to build taxonomies that it's very hard to formalize uh, things that come from natural language. So it, to find the exact definition of all the terms that people use, especially in this field, is very hard. But this is where they are now, and it's a work in progress, so it will keep growing in the future. And this is a view of um, taxonomy, for example, for a, a biological process. If you are talking about cell communication, then a response to external stimulus is a subclass of cell communication. Response to biotic stimulus, defense response is a subclass, again, of all these. And if you want to talk about the immune response, you can cite this genontology term, and everybody will be able to go to genontology and see exactly where this term is in the taxonomy of concepts about biological processes. OK, I think we're out of time. It was just a conclusion slide that I'll just let you read, because um, I think it's just repeating what I've been saying so far, that. Um, 
we are drowning in data and converting this data into knowledge is not easy. We need automated tools uh, to access this data, to make sense of it, to uh, convert it into formats that we can use. And of course, this is a challenging task uh, because, as we saw, biomedical data covers a whole spectrum of knowledge representation and management techniques that, that we know about. 